Hello folks, Mink back here with Planescape Torment. Exactly right where we left off last time, at the entrance of the Smoldering Corpse. Which I guess is named because of this uh, human torch looking guy, Ignis. But yeah, I said I recognized this, and I remembered recognizing it. Or, uh, I remember it because, for some reason, this guy on fire, I always thought was kind of neat. But, he doesn't do anything. This crackling, billowing creature twists slowly above an iron grill upon the floor of the bar. It may have once been human, but now its skin is charred beyond recognition. Streams of fire form a wreath around the creature's body, and the flames lick at the few remaining pockets of flesh, causing them to bubble and run like wax down the creature's skeletal frame. Greetings? The thing makes no response. It rides slowly within the flames. It lives, but it does not seem aware of anything other than the fire that surrounds it. Its skin is flame, its heart is flame, and you know within some shadowed corner of your memory that this thing is dangerous. Examine the creature. The heat surrounding this creature is incredible. To your surprise, the iron grill the creature floats above has sagged and bent from the heat. At first you thought the heat came from the grill, but now you realize it emanates from the creature. As you watch, flecks of ash drift from the writhing corpse and float slowly to the ceiling. But yeah, and you know he's a companion at some point, because the game tells you he is. Exactly where, I don't remember. Is that in the journal? Yes. Anna, who we met in the hive, is a companion at some point. But there he is, Ignis. And I have never made it far enough in this game to get either Anna or Ignis as companions. So... Who knows? But it also was Mort... Us, the nameless one. Dakon, who I believe is also in this bar. Who we will be talking to eventually. And of course all the uh, various creatures we came across are also in here. Dianara, doll, female dustman, male dustman, Fell is in here. Huge thug. We did not meet the Lady of Pain, but for some reason she is in here. I guess because we talked about her? Don't know. Six giant squirrels with a headdress, robe, and a ring of levitation. <laughs> oh. oh, man. That would be hilarious. Okay. <coughs> Female townsperson. An upper-class townie. Now that's what the upperclassmen wear. Okay. At least they're modest. I'm gone. Drusilla. This is a woman with fading bruises on her face and arms and a look of despairing longing in her sunken eyes. She might have been pretty once, but those days were long ago. She turns slowly to face you. Life pours into her features and the spark of sardonic light that dances in her eyes now makes you wonder if your eyes were deceiving you. Welcome to the smoldering corpse, scarred man. Who are you? I, I am Drusilla, and, if you, and you must be clueless. Don't ask me how I know that, it just shines off you. <laughs> clueless? I think not. 
She smirks at you and her bruises seem almost to fade. Whatever you say, dearie. Whatever, answer some questions. I, Traveler, what is it you seek? Who is that burning by the entryway? Updated my journal. That the sparrow you saw in her face before flits across it again like a black winged shadow before she masters herself. That's Ignis, one of the greatest wizards ever to come out of this slummy excuse for a cesspool. They caught him and they opened the channel that a plane of fire threw him and now he's just a doorway for it, keeping himself alive by force of will alone. If someone could douse him for a few moments, it'd give him his life back again. But they don't make enough water to do that. What's your connection to him? Her voice practically throbs with a deep ache. I was Ignis' lover, and he my beloved. He loved the flame more than me, and now he has become the flame. And because I love him, I love the flame. But that's all done with now. Now I wait for him to douse himself. I sell what little I have, just so I can be near him. Weirdo. <clears throat> I'm looking for a collector by the name of Farad. Have you seen or heard of him? Farad, she snickers. The Collector King? You can probably find him and his sneaking ilk in the trash warrens on the far side of the hive. Good luck in getting any answers from him. He's a sly devil, he is. I'm looking for a journal. A journal? Oh, sure. I've kicked an eye out for all straight journals. Just in case some scarred man walks into my favorite bar and starts asking about it. Do you ask that of everyone you meet? What a fascinating life. You have a smart mouth on you, don't you? Aye, a smart mouth's for a smart head. I ain't the addled cove. You might think, sod. I got a brain on me. <clears throat> what can you tell me about this place? Here? This is the smoldering corpse, though the person smoldering ain't dead yet. He's just keeping himself alive till someone comes along to help him out. So it's like to see people in pain come here. Fiends like it. Folks who don't much care for being bothered come here too. The name alone keeps out most of the perks. Good name for you. Farewell. Kandrian. <coughs> you see a soft looking man with gentle, far staring eyes. He dresses in supple leather, leather clothing and carries various implements of use and destruction about his body, such as ropes, spikes, tinder boxes, and empty vials of air. He looks half gone, literally. There is an insubstantiality to his existence, as if his essence had been partially leached away. He focuses those eyes on you, and suddenly you find them grouping and determined. Greetings to you, O oh Seeker. Greetings. He carefully sets down the mug he's holding and gives you all his attention. I have seen the far reaches of the multiverse and returned to tell the tale. I have walked upon the bodies of dead gods and spun moonbeams in the astral ahead of a thousand shrieking Githyanki knights. I have passed the edges of existence and watched my essence shiver away before me. What is it I can do for you? I had some questions for you. Perhaps I have some answers for you. Speak and I shall tell you. Who are you? I am Candrian Illborn, traveler, dreamer, tale spinner, and so forth. You are a traveler? Tell me of the plains. I am tired, Seeker, so tired. I am fresh back from negation. I will answer what I can for you, but I cannot promise that you will find satisfaction in the answers I give. What would you know? Would you hear of the outer plains, the prime material, or the inner plains? What's the difference? The difference is true essence, Seeker. The inner planes are matters, substance, true physic physicality. 
They are the building blocks of the multiverse, for it is from them that all belief in the elements springs. The inner planes filter through the ethereal plane, the plane of potential, some say, which forms the elements into the world's immortals. Once past the ethereal plane, one reaches the prime material, where exist all manner of mortals and monsters and myths and machines. It is there that belief is born, and there that the spirits that create the outer planes are born. When mortals die, they pass through the astral plane, a no place that is thought and mental energy itself. It is in all things and in none. It is paradox, among other things, and it filters spirits into the great ring. Do you comprehend so far? Uh, yeah, go on, sure. Now, the outer planes, where should I start? Do you know the cardinal rules of the planes on which all others are based? Do you know about the composition of the outer planes? Do you know of the great ring and its divisions in our hearts? Do you know of the individual planes? Each of these leads to the next, and so it is best to start from the beginning. Wow. This guy is a novel. Tell me of the composition of the planes. The outer planes are created of and by belief and thought and faith. They take their imagined form from the prime material plane, shaped into the shaped into forms that stagger the imagination, built by the accumulation of belief. Belief creates the planes. Belief is power here. Change belief and you change the nature of reality. The creatures that are born here, the plane born, like the fiends and celestials, are truly born of the thoughts and concepts of mortals. They each express some sort of ideal, and the more powerful the ideal, the more powerful the being. Thus the being that symbolizes love is one of, str one of the strongest of all. Go on. That's why the powers, and gods some call them, live out here. This is where all the faith in them comes. This is where they are, at their most pure and most strong. Their realms are extensions of their very beings, manifestations of their godly essence, all of it informed by belief. So the composition of the planes is belief. Tell me of the great ring now. Among the loose unity of plane walkers, we conceive of the infinite outer planes as a ring surrounding the planes of ultimate neutrality, the outlands. The spire atop which Sigil sits is in the center of the Outlands. The further one travels away from the spire, the less neutral the plane grows, until it spills into the neighboring plains. Each of these planes impinges on the Outlands, spinning themselves into law and chaos, good and evil. The Great Road marks the demarcation between the Outlands and the gate towns that spring up around the gates to these plains. Beyond the gate towns lie the hinterlands, uncharted territory that is lost to history, that loses thought. Danger lies in the hinterlands. Go on. The outer planes differ by morality, not substance. For you, we'll divide the planes into three sets. The upper planes of good, the lower planes of evil, and the boundary planes of neutrality. These are then divided further by law and chaos, with the outlands in the middle. Which of these interests you? Wow. The Upper Plains. Of the Upper Plains, there are the Neutral Plains, the Lawful Plains, and the Chaotic Plains. What would you know? The Neutral Plains. The Neutral Upper Plains contain the Beastlands, a place of neutrality and goodness with a slight tinge of chaos, where the animals rule in the eternal noon and night. They hold Bytopia, twin paradise of industry and labor, where all work toward the good of all. And Elysium, the sweetest plane of goodness and calm I have ever come across. Alas, right now I am not well enough to enjoy any of their restorative effects. What would you hear now? Tell me of the rest of the upper... The Lawful Plains. Candrian gives a small shudder. I am not the best person to speak of the planes of law, he says, for the innate structure and ultimate patterns they impose frighten me. 
I steer clear of them because I value my individuality more than I value the knowledge they'll bring me. They include recommended Arcadia nearest the good plains to the unbending order of Mechanus and Mount Celestia, home of the Archons, an island in the Silver Sea. Okay, the rest of the upper, the chaotic plains. These are where I feel at home, though I steer clear of Isgard for the most part. The endless battles and tests of metal among the floating earthbergs of the plain don't do much for my disposition. Arborea, though, he sighs. The mountains are taller, the air clearer, the rivers purer, and the game larger than anywhere else. It is a true paradise, a place where passions run high and the wine never ceases to flow. When I have recovered enough of my wits and myself, when we have done with the outer plains, you should ask me of the inner, and I will describe my journey to you. I will return to our Borea's bowers and glades and lose myself for a time. Plains of the Great Ring. The Lower Plains. Like the Upper Plains, the Lower Plains are divided into lawful, chaotic, and neutral. Each of them varies in terms of horrors and what those horrors do to a travel of spirit, and all of them are best avoided. Which of them would you like to hear of? Start with the neutral. The neutral planes, huh? They're, they're vile and barely understandable, and they're more insidious on their own than you could ever imagine. Take Guyana, for example. Four volcanoes in stages of dormancy, floating in an infinite void, each of them somehow alive, and each of them wanting your soul by whatever means they can get it. Populate it with Yugolots, the worst of the fiends, in my opinion, and you've got the place. The plane of ultimate evil, at least that's what they call it, is the gray waste, a no place that drains color from your body and spirit, stealing away even your apathy, and it's the site of the worst battlegrounds in the war down there. Don't get me started. Then you've got Carceri on the chaotic side. Tell me about the war. Aye, the blood war. At the name, your blood feels as if it freezes in your veins. Ilborn doesn't seem to notice, wrapped up as he is in his memories. Two armies of fiends smashing together pointlessly across the lower plains, slaughtering mindlessly in the name of law and chaos. They'll aggrandize it, of course, but in the end it's about hate and stupid endeavor that aids none and harms far too many. <coughs> Tell me about carcery. Ah, uh, carcery and its poisonous jungles, acid swamps, destructive waters, strung like a string of rotten pearls nested with, nestled within one another. He pauses and looks at you carefully, again fixing you in place with his eyes. Remember this, Seeker. Carcery is a prison, home to the... Garolites, one of the most dangerous types of fiends there is. The strength of the prison is the strength of the captor, as strong as the prisoner lets it be. Destroy the prison keeper, and a body can escape the red prison. There's almost no other way out, not when the gates close themselves against you and watch you spin off into the vast space surrounding the orbs. Be wary of carcery, traveler, for its bonds can be greater than flesh. Updated my journal. Tell me about the war, I the war, blah blah blah. Tell me about the rest of the lower. The lawful planes. As much as I detest the order of the lawful upper planes, at least they present a modicum of goodness. There are lower planar counterparts, though. Archeron's a place of ricocheting cubes that never see an end to battle, swarming with the souls of dead humanoids. Bator, he shivers involuntarily. Involuntarily. Bator is a place best avoided. Those. Oh. Sorry. Bator, I guess. Those Betazu, the fiends in the corner there, are but the merest expression of the deviant corruption embodied in that soulless machine of order. If you want more, talk to them, but remember, all that is bad about bureaucracy and order originates from Bator, and it spreads like a stain across the hearts of mortals. Though there is some knowledge to be found there, it is rarely worth the spiritual rape the plane inflicts. the chaotic planes. The abyss isn't some place you, sh you should consider going. Where Bator's all orderly, the abyss is full of chaos and change and none of it's pleasant. 
When it becomes something that, that approximates normality, that's when you should be most wary of it. Uh, sorry about that. It's home to the Tanari, what most primes call demons. And they've got that name for a reason. They are unpredictable and murderous, and the few you can trust are few and far between. The few I have met who I trust, I still don't trust entirely. They are creatures of chaos and evil incarnate, and if they're putting on a friendly face, who's to say it's not part of a larger agenda? boundary planes. There are two boundary planes to my mind, and they are diametrically opposed. One of them, Mechanus, is the very essence of law, a place where beliefs fit together, interlocking, turning in a massive machine that is the entire plane. Some folks that have it that the gears of Mechanus are the engine that drives the planes. The other plane is Limbo. A swirling morass of chaos that follows no rules, none, and just when a body thinks he's classified its behavior, it goes and changes on him, or it doesn't. You just can't tell. I was in limbo not too long ago. Tell me of your journey. <coughs> he closes his eyes, remembering. <coughs> I had a Gitzerai guide me, an Anarch who could shape the illogical matter of the plane into forms of his desire. We had fought off the harrying of the Slotti, the chaos creatures who call the plane home. It seemed there were more than usual, but then one can never tell what's usual in limbo, but I digress. In the midst of all this chaos, we came across a series of huge metal interlocking cubes like some sort of puzzle box. It wasn't something we had shaped consciously or not, and we couldn't find a way inside. It was like... like a bastion of order within the confines of disorder, a seat of law. That is the best I can explain it. Updated my journal. How about the Outlands? The Outlands are absolute neutrality. Probably the best place for a body to visit in the Outer Plains outside of Sigil if you don't want to have a plane's morality forced into your heart. Everything balances out in the Outlands as it should be for the plane that sits at the center of the Outer Plains. Powers realms are scattered about here, and there are handfuls of gate towns that open into the rest of the Outer Plains. The gate towns usually mirror the philosophy of the plane their gates open onto. And if the balance of belief isn't kept in the town, the town slips into the nearby plane. It's a bad situation for everyone, because few of the folks in the towns really want that change. But enough of the outlands. What more would you want, wouldn't you know? Ugh. I think he is done. No, he's not. Tell me of the prime material. You want to know of the Prime? Visit it. The boundless worlds of that plane have an infinite variety, as do the planes, but I cannot encapsulate them as I have here. Suffice it to say, they are the birth of the outer planes, the children of the inner, and they hold limitless potential within their boundaries. What did you mean when you mentioned negation before? His eyes cloud over. I went to the inner planes to discover my true essence. I made the mistake of visiting the negative material plane in order to understand my body's urge to decay and the cycle of death in life. I thought myself protected against the ill effects of the plane with my magic, but I was wrong. 
The blackness of infinite nothing pressed on my soul, and I was beset by shadows that sought to snuff out my very soul. I lost my way for a time, for an eternity, and nearly lost my existence. I could feel my essence falling away from me, and I'm even now half gone. Never will I return. How'd you Updated survive? my journal. How did I survive? He smiles tightly. With a piece of nothing that held back the nothing. Nothing can stop nothing, you know, and so I carried nothing in my hand to protect me. You planned the journey to the ultimate negation yourself. You have the smell of desperation about you, and so I make you this gift. Hold it in your hand when the shadows press in, and it should protect you and your friends somewhat, should they remain close to you. <laughs> it passes you a small black token that looks as, as if it has no dimensionality to it at all. Oh, I think he's finally done. <coughs> I met a woman named Ingress with very bad teeth. She said she had come through a portal from some world that was opened by a tune hung near two cross trees. Can you get her home? He pauses briefly, thinking, I know the portal of which you speak, though I have not traveled it these thirty years gone. I will take her home, Seeker. Go tell her to await my arrival, then meet me back here, and I will tell you if I was successful or not. Updated Thanks. my journal. Negative token. Words against shadows. Special holds shadow creatures temporarily. This is a negative token, a flat black disc that appears to have no substance to it at all. Turning it over reveals that it has no third dimension. There is no thickness to this item at all. It gives you some command, some command over creatures of shadow. You can command them to stand still for a few, few precious seconds. The more powerful the shadow, the less likely you will obey your command. As an added benefit, as long as this token is carried by any of your party members, it acts as a ward against shadows. It will not prevent shadows from attacking your group, but the shadows will find it more difficult to harm you while the token is carried. Hmm. Mort, you can have that. <coughs> anyway, let's go tell Ingress. Women are the reason I became a monk, and, uh, the reason I switched back. I'm gone. I don't think you're a monk, Mort. Did you see that? I'm 
gone. Hello, Ingress. You see Ingress. She is huddled inside her cloak of dirty rags, her teeth chattering. She is glancing furtively about her as if expecting to be attacked at any moment. Greetings, Ingress. Hey, you! She squints at you. What is it you want me now? You want me to leave? Not leaving this city, so I'm not. I can't try it. It's not a city. It's a prison to everywhere. Ingress, I found someone who can take you back to your home plane. Ingress falls silent. I want to go. I want to leave this place. His name is Candrian. He should be along shortly to help you. Trust him, Laura. Ingress says nothing, merely nods quietly, her teeth chattering inside her mouth. I'll go back and meet Candrian at the Smoldering Corpse Bar and make sure everything turned out alright. Be strong. Updated my journal. And if I remember, this house... Shalandra. Wizard practicing. And yet another interruption. A person cannot even find privacy within one's home. Please leave before I summon the guards, or better yet, I'll try out a new spell I've been toying with. I wish to learn more about this box. You hold out Morador's box for Shalandra to examine. Ah, uh, yes, I remember this box well. I acquired it some time ago. What do you wish to know about it? did you get it from? Hmm, let me think. I don't recall whom I got it from. I just remember I was down in the marketplace looking for some spell components when some person offered me this box. After testing the box, I found it to be cursed, but was intrigued by the spells woven into the box, and so I purchased it anyway. If you were so intrigued by the box, what made you decide to give it away? I was young and brash back then. In my relentless pursuit of knowledge, I carelessly undid one of the spells. Look closely at the box. It was like new when I had it. The signs of decay are an indication that the spells are weakening. I realized I, I, realized I was in danger if I kept the box any longer. So I held a contest to get rid of it. A uh, contest? It was the most expedient way to rid myself of it. I simply invited all the bashers in the hive to fight each other to determine who was the best. Bashers is notorious for having big muscles and not much upstairs, if you know what I mean. They came like flies to honey. I offered some money and the box as a prize. I believe some basher named Braskin won the contest. You seem to know something about magic. Can you tell me what spells have been put on this box? You know the history behind the box. The only thing I have been able to learn is its name. It is called the Morador's Box. As to who Morador is or the origins of the box, I do not know. For many years I studied the box and tried to learn its secrets. Spell upon spell upon spell has been woven into it. To my amazement, my studies revealed that all the spells are of the type used to confine fiends. Fiends? You mean there are fiends trapped within this box? No, not fiends. A fiend. And judging by the sophistication and power of these spells, it would have to be one of significant standing and power in its realm. Can you safely remove the spells on this box? Seeking to remove yourself from this box, eh? That spell is the worst of them all. Basically, that particular spell draws energy from the current owner of the box and uses it to power one of the spells of confinement. That isn't the worst of it. The fiend inside can smell this energy and would more than likely hunt down that person should it escape. It's really a no-win situation to own that box. Either it drains you dry of your energy, or the fiend within kills you. Is there a way to safely dispose of Morador's box without hurting anyone? <laughs> I am not strong enough to fight or banish such a creature. It's been ages since I've been there, but there was a cathedral located in the middle of the Alley of Dangerous Angles. 
A priest or someone who gains their power from a higher source might be able to help you. Yeah, Updated my journal. Uh, okay. All right. I forgot about the thingamajig up there. Done. I forgot to talk to Craddock. Uh, well. All right. Candrian stands as you approach him. The Tooth Woman wanted you to have these, he says, holding out his hand. She wanted to express her thanks, even out the balance even out the balance book as it were, and be done with the damn things. In the palm of his hand are Ingress's dancing teeth, and he smoothly deposits them into your hand. Enjoy them, Seeker. Updated my journal. Seven fifty in an item. You know a collector named Farad. Farad grew up to be a collector. How long ago was this? When I set out last, he was but an officious stripling in one of the upper wards. Heh. <laughs> Time does change some people. No, Seeker, I don't know Farad anymore, I'm willing to bet. I'm looking for a journal. I've seen no journals lately but for my own. That has crumpled away into nothingness. My apologies. back from negation. What is this place? Unless the cosmos has shifted or we've been spun into the mazes, I would say that we're in the smoldering corpse tavern. Mazes? What do you mean? Aye, the mazes, where the lady dumps those have displeased her. He makes a small semicircle over his heart as he speaks the lady's name. If you know more of the lady in the city, find a tower or some such guide. Tell me the patrons. I mind my own business here, Seeker, for I spend too much time not mind him, minding it. Speak to the bartender if you would learn more of his customers. I believe that's all he can offer us then. Ingress's teeth. He's a bull by Mort. One to six crushing. It says a handful of Ingress's living teeth. Apparently they didn't want to go with her back through the portal to her home plane. They rattle amongst themselves whenever they are held close together. They remind you of a bunch of creepy ivory hopping bugs. To change the teeth to a different type, select use. The teeth may gain new options and abilities as Mort goes up in levels. Huh. You examine Ingress's teeth. You can't shake their resemblance to ivory bugs. You get the feeling that they're looking at you expectantly, awaiting some command. I want you to do piercing damage, ignore the teeth. So Mort's bite is one to three piercing. These are one to six crushing, and it can switch to piercing. Teeth elongate and the sharp fangs. One to six piercing.
but we'll switch back to crushing, shorten and become blunt. Hey. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, come on. Hey. Hey, hey, come on. Ebb Creek knees. You see a slightly stooped old man with a full gray beard and a lion's mane of gray hair. He wears a couple of shoulder guards as armor and he keeps a helmet nearby. He smokes a pipe and carries a pouch of tobacco around his waist. He looks pretty strong, but he's a little plump and also appears to have some sort of breathing trouble. Well now, aren't you a sight, lad? Never have I seen so many scars blanketing a fella. Like a scar cloak you're wearing. Where you been? Hanging out in the green thresher? He laughs. Oh, I'm just jesting with you, lad. No offense meant. I hope no offense taken. I'm Ebb. He extends his hand. Greetings, Ebb. His handshake is firm. Now I hereby tender my apologies for the unfair jesting, lad. Hope no hard feelings. And I buy you a tankard or two of something to smooth any ruffled feathers. I guess. That's the spirit lad. Bide a moment. He rises to his feet and heads to the bar. After a moment, he returns to his seat with a pair of tankards. Here you go, lad. Drink up! He takes a massive swallow from his own tankard, puffs on his pipe, and says, What can old Ebb do for you on this fine sigil day? And some questions? Oh, well, I gathered that, just to look at you. I mean, you don't look like you're from around these parts, lad. You look a little too out of sorts to be a seasoned native. Ed chuckles and takes another drink. So what can I help you with, lad? You need to know the lay of the land? Ed winks. Who are you? Ebb Creek Knees, third measure of the harmonium, now retired and being a tout with one's voice since I don't step as lightly as I might these past two or three decades. He chuckles. Now, lad, who be you and what trouble might you be in? Third measure of the harmonium. It puffs up slightly in pride and gets a semi-stern look on his face. Aye, third measure of the harmonium. He relaxes a little. Though I haven't served a tour of duty in many a decade, pushing a quill wasn't quite up my alley after all the fights and skirmishes I've been in, so I just bide my time keeping tabs on things down here in the hive and helping out a little where I can. And you look like someone who might need a hand. Are you in some kind of trouble, lad? <clears throat> a few troubles. I woke up in the mortuary and seem to have forgotten who I am. Yeah? Ebb blinks and then frowns. What was that you said, lad? That you woke up in the mortuary? Ebb studies you closely. Oh, now, did they mistake you for a dead under all them scars, mayhap? Ebb chuckles. Can't say I would have been any smarter. He puffs his pipe. Them dusties. He catches himself. I mean, them dustmen. Dusties being too rude a term to refer to them pale-faced fellas. I don't mean them too much disrespect. They have all the perceptions and friendliness of a gravestone sometimes, eh? Can't say I couldn't see them screwing that up, no lad. You know someone named Farad? Farad? Ebb frowns, then takes the pipe from his mouth. Now lad, why you be ending up with a burk like Farad? I think he stole some of my belongings. Oh, no doubt, lad, no doubt. Ebb grumbles, chewing on his pipe. You have to chain up everything around that grasping little spider. He should have been one with the faded, the way anything not chained down slips into his parlor. You don't give him a yard or he'll take the wig, eh? What do you know about him? Well, no, I don't know everything there is to know about old Farad, but I know some of the dark surrounding him. If you're determined to track down that spider and nail him to a wall, then I suppose I could spill some of the chance so you know what you're detangling with. <coughs> Excuse me. He pauses to tamp his pipe. 
Farad dug his nest deep into Rat Picker Square not too long ago, but about got a bunch of collectors and gangs together and started what one could almost consider a collecting faction. Be that as it may be. Where can I find him? Well, lad, if you're looking for Varad, which I would say is pretty barmy of you if you're a little off the beaten path, you want to be finding Rag Picker Square. Jen is that Farad set up his kip somewhere in the square. Even an old fellow like me who's been around the ring a few times don't know exactly where. I figure that Farad wants to keep the dark on his location dark. If you're all bound and determined to find Farad, go to Rag Picker Square and try to dig up Farad's location from some of the locals. Try and be careful about it, since there's plenty in the square that would make a gut hard body as soon as you look at as soon as as soon as look at you. I'm missing a journal. You're missing a journal? Was there more to the journal than just pages and words? Otherwise I can't imagine too many bullets who would bother themselves with letters unless it re was really hot and spicy. Not much use for books of learning around here. I don't know where you might find such a thing. It puffs on his pipe and snaps his fingers. But you know, lad, if Farad is the one who scraped you off the sigil street, then he might know the dark of where your stuff is. It's most likely in his larder, if you ask me. A dead man is usually in no position to keep his possessions when the collectors tumble, tumble across his body. Sigil, it laughs. You don't think small, do you? If you want to know what's outside the city, go talk to Candry and Ilborn over there. He's the traveler of this place. As for the rest of it, well, I can tell you of the lady, the Dabas, keys and portals, the way we keep track of time, the way the city is laid out. What it was? What was it you wanted to know? Tell me of the lady. Well now, not many know much about her, lad, and I'm figuring even those that know more than a little don't know too much more. She's a mystery, she is, and even should you run across her, powers forbid, she's silent and deadly. She's not evil, far as I can tell, but she keeps the dark about herself and sigil pretty tight. None's been able to penetrate it, and if they have, they've been mazed. Mazed? What do you mean? I sometimes bloods will be pack, packed off to a place where they can't do no harm. The lady, see, she'll take a bit of sigil and make a little dimension of pocket out of it, a maze. She places those that have crossed her in there and lets them rot. It puffs his pipe. Now, you can escape getting mazed once the lady sets her gaze on you, lad. She'll get you eventually, no matter how hard you try and dodge her. You'll be walking down an alley, or about to step through a portal, or take a left turn down a street you've gone many full times before, and suddenly you're someplace you don't recognize. Now, mazes aren't escape proof. There's always a way out of each one, a portal the lady places there. You just have to figure out where it is and how to use it. Tell me of Sigil's time. The way we measure time in sigils, by the brightest of the sky. See, we haven't got a sun and moon like most worlds. We just got this everlasting haze that brightens and darkens at regular cycles. What most folks call midnight, we call anti-peak. What they call noon, we call peak. See, it's based on the peak and anti-peak of the brightness. So when, something, so when someone says something about five hours past peak, that's what they mean. Tell me of the Dabas. Aye, those funny floating bloods that speak in symbols. Hip laughs. Quite a piece of work, eh? The Dabas are kind of the ladies' janitors and workmen, doing exactly what she wants. Make sure sigils running up to snuff, patching walls, tearing down old buildings, building new ones, setting up portals, sealing off others, and on and on. They're a pretty neutral faring bunch, and you don't want to interfere with or kill one, or you'll bring the lady's wrath down on you right quick. That's some other questions. Uh, what is this place? You're in a smoldering coops bar. Tell me about the patrons. 
Who's that smoldering corpse? Him? Oh, no corpse, lad. No dead or him. Near as we can tell, old Ignis is still alive inside that little roast spit. Near as we can figure, anyway. Ev wrinkles his nose. He can smell damnably awful sometimes, too. Keeps me on the pipe to make sure it won't warm its way into my nose, it does. He chuckles. How did he get there? Eb takes a smoke from his pipe for a moment, as if deciding how to phrase his comment. Well, now, lad, Ignis had a smattering of problems and some not slight wizardly magics to boot. And seldom do the two mix well, if you understand me. He liked to... Eb puffs on his pipe and smoke trails up. Well, he liked to burn things, and he started torching places and people and generally making a bunch of trouble. And... Well, now most of this was going on in the Hive, and I'll be the first to admit that the Hive is not the first place the Harmonium goes to keep Sizzle's Law. It looks a little shamefaced. A failing on our part, since it may be the place where our presence is most needed. So, by the Lady's reckoning, there was a little street-side justice in the wizardly community. A bunch of tea-leaf readers, hedge wizards, and midwife witches got together and managed to weave a spell that was kind of poetic justice. Eb gestures with his pipe at the figure. So now he sits there and burns. He's still alive, which I don't think they counted on. Tell me about the patrons. Well, you got O, who came, claims to be a letter instead of a person. Some mercy killers want waiting around for a criminal, Pero Abishai on furlough from the Bruddler, Blood War, a Gitzerai over there who's been watching you from afar, not too unusual, mind you, they're peery cutters, and Elias down there, a clueless kid whose britches seem to be just a bit too tight, if you kept my meaning. For wanting information on the planes, talk to Cadrian Ilborn over there, he knows more than most I know. It's good to drink. Well, not some say I've got a baterol discrimination when it comes to drink, but I've got drinks I'm partial to and some vintages to which I'm not. Actually, one of my favorite little things to get here is some Aberean fire seeds. You swill them in your mouth, add a little air and some spit and some alcohol, and you can breathe a little fire when you need to. Leastways, that's how it feels. I suppose, for a while. Elias. You see a trim, muscular man dressed in clothing that is comparatively drab and mundane compared to most of the outfits you've seen in this city. He carries himself with an air of supercilious arrogance. He also looks dramatically out of place here. What do you want? He asks. I am Elias, a warrior of renown. Surely you've heard of me. No. Can it truly be? Can it truly be that none in this town have heard of me or my exploits? Alas, I shall have to prove myself all over again. Here I had thought my fame had spread across the world. <laughs> 